¿Qué tal? Bienvenidos a este encuentro del de Festival de las Letras Europeas que se lleva a cabo o se celebra gracias a la Unión, a la Embajada de la Unión Europea en México en colaboración con la Feria Internacional del Libro de Guadalajara. Son más de 10 años que se celebra este encuentro que reúne escritores de las más diversas lenguas y de todos los países que están integrados en la Unión Europea y que en esta ocasión continuamos en la 35 quinta Feria Internacional del Libro. El día de hoy vamos a tener el gusto de conversar con una de las autoras de, de la Unión Europea. Se trata de Sophie Oxanen. Ella es una escritora finlandesa que ha sido traducida a más de dos decenas de idiomas y que tiene mucho, mucha, eh, muchos libros y mucha presencia en diferentes partes del mundo. Antes de comenzar la conversación con ella, vamos a, a eh, presentarla. Ella nació en Jivascula, en una ciudad que se encuentra eh, a la orilla del lago Payane. Eh, esto es en el centro sur de Finlandia, al norte de Helsinki. Y bueno, eh, ella ella eh, es eh, hija de un padre electricista y de una madre ingeniera de Estonia que llegó a Finlandia en 1970. Oksanen estudió literatura en las universidades de Jivaskula y de Helsinki y posteriormente estudió arte dramático en el Teatro Academia de Helsinki. Oksanen también es muy activa en los debates y columnas de opinión. Llegó a ser muy conocida por su primera novela eh, titulada Stalin in Lehmat, que es algo así como traducido como Las vacas de Stalin, que fue publicado en 2003 y que eh, versa sobre los trastornos alimentarios y las mujeres estonias inmigradas en Finlandia. Pues estuvo nominada para los premios Runeberg y en 2005 publicó Baby Jane, una novela sobre desórdenes de ansiedad y violencia en las parejas lesbianas. Su primera obra de teatro se estrenó en el Teatro Nacional de Finlandia en el 2007. Es Pudish Tush que es más o menos así como pureza y que eh, en México o en habla hispana fue conocida como purga. Esta misma obra de teatro en 2010 tuvo una versión en novela eh, que eh, fue reconocida internacionalmente con el Premio de Literatura del Consejo Nórdico, el Premio Fémina de Literatura Extranjera, el Mika Baltari y el Runeberg. También recibió el Premio Europeo a Mejor Novela. Eh, vamos a continuar, movió un poco... Bueno, continuando con las cosas que ha hecho eh, Sophie Oxanen, esta misma novela purga se publicó más o menos de ahí del 2015 por Editorial Almadía. Y cuenta la historia de, 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 de una Estonia en la guerra eh, que busca la independencia a través de dos personajes, la joven Sara que huye de un traficante de mujeres y la anciana Ali de Tru que malvive en su casa en una lejana zona rural en 1992. En marzo de 2013, Sophie Oxanen ha sido galardonada con el Premio Nórdico de la Academia Sueca al conjunto de su obra, siendo la primera mujer finlandesa que recibe este reconocimiento que es considerado como el pequeño Nobel eh, desde 1989 se entrega a solamente autores escandinavos. En 2015 visitó por primera vez nuestro país cuando estaba presentando su novela Kunki Kiset Katoshibat, que es eh, Cuando las palomas cayeron del cielo. Es una crítica muy fuerte de la Rusia de Vladimir Putin y también una activista importante por los derechos de eh, la colectiva LGTBIQ+. Ella es Sophie Oxenen. Sophie, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for inviting me. Sophie, can you tell us something about uh, what are the, the, the things that, uh, um, uh, what are the, the engines uh, uh, for grinding? Uh, sorry, like. No, no engines, uh, your motivations, your motivations ah. for, for grinding. Uh, it's always so difficult to know where the story starts or when the writing actually inside my head starts. Uh, um, I do know always the exact date when I create the first file for the novel, but uh, usually uh, there has been something happening in my head uh, way back before that. Um, but usually I'm interested in stories that um, somehow reveal, reveal what's happening before and behind the big narrations or big headlines. I'm not interested in the headline itself or the highlighted years of our history. I'm interested in what's, uh, what's happening behind the scenes, uh, behind the scenes of the history. And I'm always more interested in uh, the stories of those who didn't win. 
do you think through literature can can we be a little bit more justice with uh, the people uh, yes I, I think literature is an excellent tool for well creating empathy for example and that i believe quite many res researchers agree with me um, but let's think for example victor hugo and Les Miserables, uh, at the time uh, it was an eye-opener for uh, middle class and upper class who actually didn't really see the life of those who didn't belong to their, uh, to their world, to their class. Now, of course, we do have movies and uh, that uh, sh movies and TV shows and books as well showing us the lives of people whose life and the sphere of life might be very far from ours. Uh, and I think that is extremely difficult to, um, uh, well, at least for democratic development, even though it's not a solution for democracy, but at least we do understand um, what's, uh, understand the world better, simply. And um, it is also a very good tool to erase discrimination and inequality as well. Usually those who don't have money Do you... don't have the voice and therefore I think it's culture. Culture and art are the, are the fields that needs to uh, defend the voices of those who might not have the tools to do them. Do it or not have the possibility to, uh, uh, to tell their story for different reasons. You, you, you are a Finnish person, but Estonian person too, because your mother came from Estonia. You, you have your grandmother in Estonia. So as a child, you, you, you live those different reality, the reality of Finland and the reality of USSR. Um, in, 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 the, in the beginning of the 90s, uh, Estonia changed a lot. Uh, suddenly, uh, was a country without a government, without institutions, and need to, 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 to start from the beginning. And now it's uh, one of the countries with the best connections, digital connections in the world. 90% 90, 90 of all the activities, uh, they can do it through, through internet. But, but this is not the modern life. This is not just the best. I mean, uh, uh, as a country, uh, have a lot of problems, uh, a lot of authoritarianism. Uh, how do you see that reality when right now people think that media and, and, and digital world is the only, the only thing, the best thing to be uh, and left away uh, human aspects? Uh, well, uh, Estonia's... Um recent past uh, is uh, a surprising story. Uh, uh, it went through double occupation, two Soviet occupations and one German occupations and, and regained the independence in 1991. Um, and after that, um, Estonia, a small, very agile country, eager to uh, connect with the West. Um, was a very creative place as well because they had to start the whole society from the scratch and that is actually one of the reasons why it's so digital why it is e-estonia uh, because they didn't have the uh, they had to get rid of all the old systems and for example skype is an estonian invention um, but uh, estonia um, is uh, exception when you think about the uh, all the former Soviet occupied countries because quite many of them are still struggling with a very heavy corruption uh, and the collapse of Soviet Union also lead to other problems as uh, as well and at the moment of course I do worry about the um, about uh, social media not really taking seriously their responsibility for supporting democracy, for example, um, like and also uh, the problems with uh, 
uh, fake news spreading like wildfire. Um, these are the problems that also uh, very uh, well countries like Nordic countries also uh, suffer. So um, at, at the present, uh, freedom of speech, freedom of um, media and journalism are very uh, important topics. But I mean, when you're talking about the human, human aspect, uh, then um, um, uh, well, I don't know. I don't see the digital world uh, as something opposite to the uh, human world. I mean, I think we can go match together very well. Uh, I'm, I'm much more worried about the uh, the social media companies not taking uh, their responsibilities seriously. I mean, they are also responsible for um, making sure that uh, they are not spreading um, fake news, propaganda, for example, uh, fake information about pandemia, for example. They should be, they should be, think themselves as a media uh, but they are not seeing themselves as a, as a media or, or a companies that need to follow the ethic rules of journalism. Mm. I'm asking you about this, Tonya, because um, it's a topic very important in, in, in your books. But you have another kind of topics. What topics did you address in your books and why were they chosen to be a part of your work? Um, well, uh, in Perch, um, I was writing about human trafficking, which was one of the consequences of, uh, of the collapse of Soviet empire. Um, because the, when an empire collapses, there's always a very good uh, ground in those unstable uh, conditions. Very, very good ground for criminal activities and exploitation. Um, then again, um, I wrote about fake news in when the doves disappeared. Um, I mean, of course, at the time, uh, fake news was not the word that was used, but it's about um, a faking history uh, according to the recommendations of KGB in Soviet Union. And those same methods are still in use in Russia. Uh, so that is why uh, why I wanted to write about these uh, fake news before uh, internet arrived. Uh, the toolbox is the same, only the uh, uh, the um, ways to operate that toolbox is a little bit different. But it's not actually uh, anything new. We've met this kind of uh, problems before as well and survived. Um, then these these novels deal with the Estonian recent past and the consequences of colonial power. Uh, but then in Norma, I'm writing uh, about a different kind of exploitation, uh, and that is the surrogacy uh, and uh, and uh, human hair trade as well. Uh, I'm not saying that surrogacy itself is exploitation; it doesn't need to be. But when uh, entrepreneurs operating in the dark side uh, are uh, exploiting women uh, in fertility business, then it's definitely problematic. So uh, in Norma, uh, I'm dealing with uh, modern uh, human trafficking, that is the uh, exploitation of female bodies again. Norma, your last book in Spanish uh, from uh, 20, uh, 2020, um, it's, a, it's very different than your other books. I mean, uh, in your other books could be like in realistic style. And in Norma, you, are, uh, you were inspired by, uh, by a fairy tale, uh, Rapunzel. Yeah. Um, why, you, why you decide to do that? Uh, well, uh, this is one of those examples where um, the story comes to me by accident. Uh, uh, when I started to write Norma, I had a, had a very short period where I didn't have any 
other big projects or deadlines and I thought that I'm just gonna have fun uh, and uh, I thought that okay I'll write rewrite the story of Rapunzel. Uh, Rapunzel was my favorite fairy tale as a child and that is why I chose Rapunzel but when I, I was expecting that it would be just you know a short story but then it was so much fun that I ended up writing a novel um, and um, this is one of those examples of a novel where you don't actually know when the story has started to started to whirl in your head because Rapunzel is the fairy tale I read as a child and I'm quite often asked why I was so fascinated by Rapunzel um, because quite many actually women have said to me is that Rapunzel is such a passive princess so why you were fascinated by her but when you think about Rapunzel it's a princess fairy tale and I was brought up with uh, Soviet children's books in Soviet children literature there were no princesses they were more like educative um, stories um, trying to uh, also teach something about the Soviet system. So royalties were not part of that uh, genre in Soviet Union at all. So Rapunzel was my first uh, Finnish children's book and I was totally uh, I was totally taken by the story because it was my first Western uh, uh, children's book um, and the story stayed with me and I don't think actually the Rapunzel is a passive person at all. I mean she is actively singing uh, to find a better solution for her, uh, for her uh, destiny. But anyway it was so much fun um, writing it that uh, Writing that, uh, sh so I, I just needed to write the whole novel. Mm. Uh, what is the impact in your work uh, of the current events in the world? Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? The impact in your, in your, what is the impact in your work of the current events of the world? Uh, um. Well, when you start to write a novel, you know that it's gonna take years to finish it. And when you start the novel, you don't actually know how long it's gonna take. Take, I mean, it could be finished in two years, but on the other hand, it might take five years. And that is why it is difficult to say what the world is going to look like in five years. I mean, literature is supposed to be something that is worth something also uh, in 10 years and uh, of course I'm also hoping that my stories would have a connection or would be accessible also to the future generations. So in that way uh, when you think about something that is happening right now then uh, you don't actually know if it's going to matter in a decade no matter how important it might seem right now and what I also think is that you need to have some distance to uh, to what you are writing and that's why it's also difficult to write about the exact time or a period we are living in on the other hand um, even though I'm writing about recent past, there needs to be have some kind of connection in those themes to the world we are living in, um, or at least that is how I think, or that is how I pick my subjects and themes as well. I somehow try to understand the modern world um, through our history. So in that way, there must be some kind of connection to uh, uh, to what's happening but it's it that connection might be very light and it might be also you know just in my head but anyway if you, if you w want to write for something that is accessible also in 50 years then uh, then you definitely need to have the distance and also of course I mean when you think about um, 
the background research you have to do for for a novel um, for every single novel then uh, the research material is limited when you think about you know the present moment in 50 years there will be much more material so in that way um, current events are a little bit tricky I think current events are more like uh, a matter for journalism than than actually for literature Mm. Is there some kind of uh, commitment of, of the writer with his reality? Uh, well, um, I'm, I, I, I see myself and I'm also called a very committed author and, and uh, I do think that I am, um, but um, one can never actually you know tell what kind of interpretation a reader is going to make and different readers might have totally different kind of interpretations about the same story uh, which is of course uh, is, is the one sign of the power of literature um, but even though I might have this idea or a or a wish that readers would pick up a certain theme or become more aware of something then that I don't have a control over it. It might be something totally opposite to my wishes. Um, so, but that's also fun of, fun of it because, uh, yeah. Reality is uh, bigger than fiction, but can fiction save us from the reality? <laughs> um, <laughs> that's, a, uh, that's a good question. Um, I think... Um, um, well, uh, of course, you know, entertainment is, is a good option always if, if you want to escape from what's happening around you. Um, but um, I think also that uh, literature can be a better therapeutist or a shrink than, uh, than actually you could find in, uh, in the health sector. So, um, yes, I think that actually a fiction can be uh, uh, comforting and also uh, it's a way to help, uh, help um, well, for example, if you have lost someone, then definitely literature offers a lot of, uh, well, of course, escapism, but also comfort and also maybe uh, tools for recovering as well. Sometimes um, big traumas can be also um, uh, so huge that the person who has gone through the, the trauma don't really have words for it or you might not be able to process it uh, but literature can uh, actually offer tools for that. It can uh, offer uh, language, how to deal with that trauma. So, so in, the, in that way, I think literature is a, a fiction is, is a big, uh, big uh, uh, shrinks uh, sofa or a couch. Mm. Finland is uh, part of a, uh, from uh, part of Europe, but at the same uh, time is a part of the Scandinavian countries and it's very close uh, in history and in, in, front, uh, in frontier with, with Russia. Uh, it's a multicultural region. Um, how is great? How, how is to be a writer in, in that part of the world? Mm. Uh, well, when you think about Nordic countries, uh, then uh, being an author in Nordic countries uh, is easy. Uh, easy when you think about, and especially for example, being a female author, because for example, in Finland, over 50% of authors are actually female. And that goes all around Nordic countries. 
uh, and that actually means that we have lots of uh, female characters or female protagonists in our literature it, because um, um, and this might I don't, I don't know uh, it might sound like uh, self-evident or granted but uh, male authors tend to write about tend to have more male protagonists and female authors tend to have more female protagonists uh, so in that way we have lots of female protagonists uh, and that's of course it's a good thing but it's a um, it's a result of a long development development of equality in um, uh, in uh, Finland but what makes Finland different compared to other Nordic countries uh, is the um, well for example our well, geography. We uh, Finland is a border country to Russia. Sweden again is not, um, for example. And then Estonia has a border with Russia. Ukraine has a border with Russia. Then the Ukrainians are waging a war against Russia at the moment. Uh, so um, it um, the border with Russia makes the perspective to, for example, security matters a little bit dif dif uh, different. And uh, then, of course, I guess Swedes are very happy that Finland is between Sweden and Russia. Mm. Uh, in terms of identity, uh, it's very young. Uh, Finland, like a country, uh, but that you have your own history, your own literature, your own music, uh, uh, and and in the, the in the romantic times, for example, the musical poem Finland of Jan Sibelius was very important. Um, now, what are the most important thing uh, for the Finland identity, uh, for example, in 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 literature? Uh, um... I guess Finland sees itself uh, like a country of libraries. Uh, uh, now we are struggling with the financing our library system, but the library system has been crucial for uh, for educating people. Um, even though Finnish language is a very old one, but uh, liter literature written in Finnish uh, is not that old because before, before we um, uh, we uh, got our independence um, or declared ourselves independent state, we were um, under rule of Sweden and under rule of uh, Russia, Russian Empire. Uh, and at the time, Sweden, Swedish was the language of education in Finland and uh, usually the language of ed education is also the language of literature um, and universities, for example. So uh, at the time, uh, it was not uh, Finnish language, which is one of the finno ugric languages, was considered like a peasant language, not suitable for poetry. Um, so um, it really needed uh, national awakening, uh, and uh, and it, we needed to start to think about who we actually are before we uh, started to also to value our language as a suitable for art and poetry and um, and literature. So, but um, our um, national identity and the language and the literature actually have developed hand in hand in that way so um when um, uh, in in those countries where people speak like one of those big uh, languages um i have a feeling that the national identity might uh, it is not so connected to the language but in finland as we are the only ones speaking finnish in the world and also in estonia as estonians are the only ones speaking estonia in the world 
So uh, to us, the national identity is very much connected to uh, language. So being a Finn mm. means also like defending your language. So in that way, some way. We're talking about uh, uh, Finnish identity, but in your opinion, is there a European literature? Um, that's a very difficult to say because e Europe uh, and European Union uh, uh, well f first of all there are so many uh, national states where they publish their own literature written in their own language and most of those books are never translated into other languages therefore for example I have I don't know, for example, what's uh, the hottest topic of Slovak literature at the moment, for example. Uh, I cannot follow what's, what's the most important trend in uh, literature in Czech Republic, for example. So um, we are definitely dependent on translations. Uh, if you want to know actually what's happening in a literary, literary world on the other side of Europe. Um, and um, that's of course um, offers, offers us, uh, you know, very rich cultural literature. But if you ask if there is some sort of what is embodiment of the European literature, then I don't know if uh, if there is, or is is there is there a possibility even to to try to define it? Of, but of course, one ago, thing you know. Andrea. But uh, but one thing is, of course, that we do write more about the World War Two than authors on other continents. So, World War Two is uh, and uh, it's the. Uh, it's a big narration uh, in Europe and every single country has its own uh, literature connected to World War II. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, in Finland, the World War II is uh, connected to uh, our wars with uh, Russia, the Winter War, uh, losing also part of our country to Russia. So. Uh, that's that's our story or our big narration, very highlighted and still very popular in li literature. Then again, in Estonia, the World War II is connected to Soviet and German occupations, and um, and that's the and consequences of that occupation are the big narration of the nation which also has reflections to the literature. And of course, in German, uh, there are so many great books about the World War II uh, in every single European country. Uh, there's usually a strong tradition of novels connected to World War II. Mm. Uh, two years ago, Andrea Bajani, uh, Italian writer, uh, uh, was a part of uh, this festival of European uh, writers, and he told me something about like uh, like uh, the translator must be very important people in the world because a bad translation uh, um, could be a war. Uh, now <laughs> uh, we 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 can read you in Spanish, not all your books, but the most of your books. Uh, we can we can uh, know you. Through, through them. Uh, tell us something about uh, literature as a bridge between countries, regions, and languages. Mm. Um, yeah, yes, I'm, I'm, I have been very lucky with uh, having the possibility to work with uh, so many uh, translations, uh, translators. Um, what I've learned. Um, uh, learned um, while traveling uh, for my translations uh, is that certain stories or um, stories or, or uh, emotions connect people from one culture or one continent to another 
And even though, as I said, that Europe has plenty of literature about the World War II, then all continents do have literature about war uh, and traumas. Uh, what I've also learned is that, for example, story of occupation um, and how people survive from it or what kind of methods or tools a totalitarian system or colonial system is using, then these stories are very universal. Um, it seems like dictators are pretty much the same all, all, all around the world. Uh, so in that, in that way, um, I, I think we can be united in, uh, in our experiences and, and in, in that way, literature is, is, uh, is a very powerful tool for connecting people. Mm. For example, right now we are connected because uh, the digital world. Um, but if we read uh, something about uh, the history of 100 years ago, we can find uh, politicians very closer than some of the present. Uh, what do you think about the present and the future as a writer, from your perspective as a writer? Well, um, at, at the moment, uh, well, um, uh, let's put it like that. Uh, in the uh, 90s and even in the beginning of 2000s, um, I have a feeling that we uh, uh, borders were just, you know, going down. Borders and walls were collapsing. Uh, Berlin Wall collapsed. Iron Curtain was torn down. And, and from where I stand, it was a period where freedom, we got so much more freedom so much more freedom to travel, so much more freedom to see the world, to connect with people. Um, but then, um, now we are living a bit different kind of period, and not only because of the COVID, it seems like that democratic process and development is facing, um, facing challenges that we didn't see just a while ago. Um, and in that way, um, I think uh, authors, my, my job as an author uh, is to try to uh, make the most of the gift I have, and that is to use my freedom of speech to defend human rights. Uh, after all, authors are the ones who have the highest freedom of speech. We don't have the boss and we don't have to worry about if we are kicked out from our job. So in that way, I think it is our obligation actually to, uh, to speak up. All the topics that we are talking about right now, we can find it between lines in your books. Uh, and I have uh, my last question about the digital platforms. Uh, the last year, you, you created a very fun and provocative YouTube channel called Corona Kitchen. Why did you decide to, 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 to do it? Uh, well, I guess it, it seemed like very, uh, <laughs> very clear that I have to have my Corona Kitchen. Uh, uh, well, fir first of all, I noticed um, that Finns were um, hoarding so much food from the stores. They were hamstering up uh, with um, uh, loads of uh, tuna cans and tomato sauce. When I went to the grocery, the shelves were empty from everything that that could, um, or all, all the staple food, you know, just disappeared from the stores. And I was thinking that, okay, now certainly these people are uh, at home with all the all this canned food. Um, so maybe they they uh, they will be very fed up with this eating the same food all the time. So I wanted to uh, offer some uh, some new ideas 
um, uh, for the for, for 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 example from certain canned uh, or preserved foods that are popular in those countries where the cold chain is not as stable in as in Nordic countries and that is where I refer to Soviet Union for example and another thing is that uh, that uh, one of the uh, platforms of resistance in uh, Soviet Union was so-called kitchen talk uh, because people couldn't actually uh, share their political views in public they couldn't share them or have a political conversation uh, in their workplace they couldn't go to a restaurant and, and speak up speak freely they couldn't do that the only place where you could have a free conversation was your own kitchen that is the private space so that is why I felt that uh, in a world where you are not allowed actually to uh, see each other than actually this private place uh, that uh, uh, is, is a good way to um, good way actually to connect with people so in that way it actually felt very natural for me to do so mm -hmm. but at the same time you have a very clear idea of the image uh, for example, right now you are producing your, your own video uh, with this conversation. How is the power of the image for you as a writer? It's another kind of uh, 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 way to speak with the public. Uh, well, I, I, I don't know. Well, I, uh, when you think about all the poor quality uh, uh, digital poor quality uh, events or, or or material you might have then I, I, I would like to see it in a way that now when I cannot travel I try to um, I try to take uh, every single digital event uh, just as if it was taking place in a real world I think it's also like respecting the audience as well uh, respecting the readers um, yeah and and I think one more question. <laughs> Sorry, but you have a very important. Uh, you have a very important presence in the journalism. You have a very a very uh, important uh, view, a critic view, about Russia, about uh, uh, the world, um, and and you be a part of the the, the position uh, of of uh, as a writer in the uh, uh, in, with, with the rights of all people different people in Nordic countries we we can find a, 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 a people more equal than the rest of the world um, we we need to understand more the differences to 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 be more close with the rest of the people how do you see the world right now about the difference, the difference idea, the difference uh, sexual preference, the difference uh, 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 way to see the world. Uh, we were marching in the in the right way. Well, uh, at present, in many countries, we are ex uh, we are witnessing. Uh, a positive progress, uh, like for example, Me Too movement has been a very important uh, eye-opener uh, that has helped uh, to shape the world for a little bit more equal place, I think. Um, and it, ha it also offered a public language to talk about harassment. Um, and that, for example, is all, was also a positive example of the power of, of uh, digital world and social media as well. Uh, we have positive uh, progress, definitely. Then again, at the same time, uh, there are countries where the positive progress has been erased in a second. Like, for example, in Afghanistan, uh, where women are yeah. not allowed to do, well, anything. Um, so, and then at the same time, uh, for example, in uh, 
in certain states in the states and in Europe, in Poland, for example, the uh, abortion laws are becoming pretty impossible. At the same time, uh, contraception is much more accessible in other countries. In Nordic countries, uh, the sexual minor minorities and their rights, their human rights, are you know, just going for better. And then in other countries, the uh, sexual minorities uh, still uh, might be simply killed or hanged for who they are. So in that way, we have lots of positive uh, progress, but at the same time, backlashes, uh, and the most horrible backlashes, like in Afghanistan. But I hope, for example, that at least, you know, one generation of women in Afghanistan learn to read. Um, so that means that there are more women who can read than before in Afghanistan. And hopefully these women will teach their girls to read. So all progress, even though it was destroyed, that it didn't, didn't disappear. So that's something. Well, thank you very much for your time, Sophie Oxenen. Uh, I really appreciate uh, this conversation and I hope that all the people uh, enjoy it. Thank you and I'm very sorry I couldn't be there with you but I'm hoping that hoping to see you see you soon in a real life as well. De esta manera llegamos al final de esta conversación con Sony, Sophie Oxanen, que eh, forma parte de las actividades del de decimoprimer Festival de las Letras Europeas, que se celebra con el apoyo de la Embajada de la Unión Europea en México, en colaboración con la Feria Internacional del Libro de Guadalajara, en esta su trigésima quinta ocasión. Los invitamos a que no se pierdan las siguientes conversaciones. Hay muchas más escritoras y escritores que forman parte de este festival y nos vemos muy pronto.